Why did you leave The Daily Wire? Well, unfortunately, I can't talk about the specific reasons that I left The Daily Wire, but I, what I can do is respond to whatever reasons were given to the public. Uh, and obviously, no sooner did we agree to leave than Andrew Clavin of The Daily Wire did an entire episode uh, stating that the reasons that I was leaving was because I was anti-Semitic and I was engaging in a type of anti-Semitism that was hard to pin down. And that is why in my first episode of launching my independent podcast, I hit back pretty hard at him because you know, I think it's it's pretty despicable, first and foremost, as a colleague who I had a great relationship with, to have engaged in that, knowing that I was not at liberty to, to say anything. You know, I thought it was a very underhanded, disgusting tactic, and I responded in force. I, I want to play you what Ben Shapiro told me when I asked him about this on Uncensored. One of the consequences of this war has been a lot of very high passions on both sides, a lot of angry disagreements. You and your company have been at the centre of a very uh, high profile one at the moment with Candace Owens, who's now left Daily Wire. Um, was she fired or did she leave of her own volition? I'm not going to speak to this topic, Pierce. At, at all? At all. The only thing I will say is what I've said all along with regard to Candace or with regard to any of our other hosts, I am not in hiring and firing position with The Daily Wire. I'm a co-founder of The Daily Wire. I'm a co-owner of The Daily Wire. I'm not actually in management. And as far as the free speech situation, what I will say is that no company has the obligation to literally pay anyone. The, the Daily Wire is a, is a publisher. It is not a platform. Do you agree with that, Candace? Agree with which part? Well, OK, any of it. <laughs> well, I think that it's interesting, and I'd love to sit down with and debate Ben Shapiro on a number of topics, particularly cancel culture, because I know that he's made some comments in the past that he believes that publishers, platforms should allow people to have different ideas. And so those particular comments, to me, sound in contrast to what he has said in the past but I can't speak on behalf of him, obviously. I personally believe that media companies are healthier when you allow people to have different opinions and allow people to debate those opinions. Personally, I love to see a debate between two people. And so I can only tell you what my perspective is and can't really speak for him. I mean, he made the point at the end there that any company, any private company, when it comes to free speech, is not compelled to pay people to work for them. I mean, would you accept that as a, as a principle? Well, what I would say again is that it just kind of runs into what is wrong. I guess the question you could ask is what is wrong if CNN fires somebody mm. for having a different opinion? What mm. then is wrong if Fox News fires somebody for having a different opinion? your answer would have to be that it's not wrong and that companies are at will to curate whatever belief system that they want and to, to not allow free speech. So, you know. Out of interest, is it true that you signed an NDA and that's why you can't really talk about this in detail? I cannot speak in detail about any of that stuff. You can't even confirm whether you've had an NDA? I am not free to speak about any topic pertaining to contracts signed or not signed. And so... You see, this is where it gets interesting for me, because you, you referenced uh, Andrew Claven from The Daily Wire. I want to play the, a, a part of what he said, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. The Daily Wire parted ways with Candace Owens, and part of it was things that she was saying that we felt were strongly uh, anti-Semitic. And she was doing it in such a way that it was kind of hard to pin down, so I was trying to show where these things happen. So I, I'm bemused, because I've been involved in a lot of contracts in my time. I've been an employer, I've been an employee, and so on. I don't understand why somebody from the Daily Wire can be so explicit about the reasons you left, and yet you are not able to be as explicit to defend yourself or to counter what they're saying. Amen, Pierce. Amen. I think that is probably a question that was on a lot of people's minds. And, you know, what can I say other than what was it that Kanye was saying about 
contracts. And, you know, I, I think it is, even if you believe that it is valid for that to happen, I think it is immoral to allow someone to attack someone and to not allow them to defend their, their name. And so for me, Andrew actually rose to the level of defamation when he started claiming that I had actually said things that I had never said. I mean, he flagrantly lies. And I showed that on my platform when he pretended that I did an episode suggesting that Adolf Hitler burning books was a good thing. I wasn't even speaking about Adolf Hitler. It's a nonsense to think that I would do that on my platform. And it's a trick also. It's it's meant to make people feel em emotional. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that she's supporting Adolf Hitler. And I thought it was nasty business. I thought it was, it was extremely nasty business. And, you know, for me, Piers, it's important for me to state my name means a lot to me. You know, my grandfather grew up on a sharecropping farm, one of 12 children, you know, in, in the segregated South, Robert Owen Sr. And for him to have worked the way that he worked and to have instilled the Christian values in me that he instilled in me growing up, the idea that I would allow someone to so flagrantly throw dirt on his name, it was never going to fly. Did you ever say or do anything which to a Jewish ear could be construed as anti-Semitic? Well, let's be clear about all of these topics, whether we're talking about racism, <laughs> sexism, anti-Semitism, everything can be construed <laughs> to an ear mm. when you're talking about a subjective ear that I believe that this is racist. I mean, I could say, hey, Piers, you even asking me questions. And to me, it feels racist, right? A feeling and a fact are two different things. So what someone construes something is meaningless. Factually speaking, I have never said anything that is anti-Semitic. And had I have said something that was anti-Semitic, Andrew Claven would have simply showed the clip. <laughs> right. A lot of attention has been focused on you constantly referencing Christ is king. Um, yeah. Many people believing that although those words in themselves, if you're a Christian, as you are, um, would not be offensive, that to Jewish people, when they're being whipped up on social media, as they were at the time, by people who are genuine white supremacists and pretty brazen anti-Semites, that being smart as you are, you would have known that, that to deliberately use that phrase repeatedly in that time, in that climate, was a deliberate act of provocation to people like Ben Shapiro, who obviously are extremely high profile Jewish people. Do, do you accept I'm that? I'm sorry, what, which time frame are you talking about well, when you say since, at that time? Well, since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. Yeah, no. So that phrase, if you're talking about when it began to be a scandal, because I think everyone was quite confused when there was suddenly this narrative that it could be construed as anti-Semitic, which is mm. why it required so much explaining by people of when it became anti-Semitic. Mm. I posted a standalone Bible verse, just this is just a pure fact, uh, calling for peace. And at the end of the verse, I ended it and said, Christ is King last November. Andrew Clavin references that. The reason why this even became a scandal is because of Andrew Clavin. Andrew Clavin did an episode called Because Christ is Really King, and then he accused me wrongly of spitting that phrase at a Jew. That simply never happened, as I showed in my first episode back. It was we just made that up out of thin air. I posted a standalone Bible verse, and I wrote at the end of it, Christ is King, and then a Jew responded to me telling me to quit my job. So what happens sometimes is then time passes and people try to rewrite history, but we're not gonna do revisionist history here. I tweeted Christ is King appropriately following a Bible verse when I was 38 weeks pregnant. And I stand by that proverb and I stand by my declaring Christ to be King as I have done many times okay, in so the past two things because about it's that. basic Christian doctrine. Two things about that. Why would you tweet that particular passage from the Bible? ending Christ yes. as King on 14th of November, 2023. What was your motivation? Yeah, happy to answer that question. So if people remember what was happening at that time, um, Ben Shapiro was caught uh, on a tape calling me faux sophisticated and some other stuff, you know, a disgrace I think was the term. And again, I was 38 weeks pregnant about to give birth and my husband just told me, 
every media person in the world is contacting you globally, asking you to give a comment, to say something. It's obviously a very traumatizing thing to go through in the moment when you're that pregnant and suddenly you're like, I just don't want to deal with this drama. I don't mean like trauma in the very leftist. I feel traumatized by this, right. but just it's a lot happening leading up to birth. And my husband told me to read the Bible. He said, just read the Bible. You don't have to answer these media members. You don't have to give a comment. You don't have to say anything. These things are all fickle. It doesn't but just, matter. But just to be this clear about... on the chronology, because the, the video of Ben saying what he said, we said, I think, her, I think her behavior during this has been disgraceful without a doubt. I think her photo sophistication. That came first. Yeah, that came out on 15th of November, 2023. But you had posted what you posted on the 14th of November. That's, that's not correct. You have your timeline wrong. It was the video came first. So you were responding directly to the video. No, I, I look. Can I? I'm yeah. I'm trying to finish the story, but you just have your just so you know chronologically, you have it wrong. His insult came first. I think it was on the twelfth. The insult came. Well, you made aware um, of the insult because it, and then did it I become public? I found out public? on Twitter with everybody else. I it was just trending, you know. And um, so just to go back into it, my husband told me to read the Bible and to realize that these things are fickle and that all of these journalists that were asking me to respond to them are doing it because all they want is clicks and money and they want you, you know, they want to use you for a moment that's not going to matter in the scheme of things in your life. And so I wanted to respond to all of these media members by saying that I'm calling for I'm calling for peace. You know, Christ is king of my heart. I don't need I don't need this right now. So that was it. When you appeared on Tucker Carlson on the 16th of November, you said I'll, I will say I'm not going to respond with the same ad hominem attack. Um, but you yeah. also told him that day that that was when you first saw the video. Mm, I didn't tell him I first saw the video on Tucker Carlson. What do you... I don't understand your question. What, I told Tucker I saw the video that on you, Tucker Carlson? No, no, that you had seen the video for the first time that morning. That I saw the video trending yeah, I'm just on trying, Twitter. Yeah, not I'm, the morning yeah. of Tucker's interview. Sorry, I'm just trying, I, I don't to, work, know I'm just trying to work out the, the exact correct chronology. Yeah, I, I can help you. Yeah. So you saw Day the video on, on Twitter and then you... On Twitter, yes. Yeah. And then you put then, out the passage from the Bible as a reaction to seeing the video. Yes, like I said, twenty maybe it was 24 hours later after that, mm. when everyone was contacting me for comment, I gave the media no comment. So if you look on all the articles, there was no comment given to me at that mm. time about anything because I decided that peace was the best strategy forward. Tucker was booked that day but he had booked me six weeks in advance. That was mm. just his luck that that whole incident took place. Right. Um, you know, they knew I was going on his show. He books way out in advance. So it just happened to be his luck or misfortune, whichever way you look at it, that that was going on at the same time. So it, in the build up to this, you'd already made it clear that you, or you'd said on Twitter on November the 3rd, no government anywhere has a right to commit a genocide ever. There is no justification yeah. for a genocide. I can't believe this even needs to be said or is even considered the least bit controversial to state. You didn't say what you were talking about in that tweet, but it was widely assumed to be Gaza and what Israel was doing in Gaza. Is that correct? Were you talking about Israel there? No, actually, when I wrote that tweet, if you look right before that tweet, I had retweeted and liked something from a journalist named Yashar Ali. He had shared a clip of a congressman, Brian Mast, who got up on a platform and said that there's no such thing as an innocent Palestinian life. That is despicable, genocidal language. And um, I am paraphrasing here, but Yashar Ali said, and he's pro-Israel, by the way, if I'm, yeah. if I'm judging by what he puts online, he said, can we all just admit that this language is unacceptable? And I tweeted that no government in the world, and I, I was actually commenting on America, um, genocide is always wrong. And so, by the way, even if I was talking about Israel or I was talking about Palestine, that statement should hold. No, there I agree. is I agree, no just, justification no, ever I agree, in the I agree, world but, but for, the for record, genocide. So I agree. But, I was very surprised to see that tweet go viral and people so angry about it. Uh, I was actually overseas at the moment. I was in the UK. And so it seemed very strange to me that people would have a problem with it no matter what side you're on. But in that particular moment, I was talking about Brian Mass and on my show, my very next show, I clarified that. And, and do you think, for the record, that what Israel's been doing constitutes genocide? Well, what I've been having trouble is all of the people that are pro-Israel and say it's not a genocide won't tell me what is a genocide. How many, what percentage of a population has to be killed before we can use the word genocide? It's a funny little thing. <laughs> they won't tell you. They won't tell you what constitutes genocide. So I would like a clear understanding of how many Palestinians have to die before we are allowed to term it a genocide. 
all of the experts can't agree on what a genocide actually is, but they love to float around the world the word on virtually every other issue. You know, I had Rabbi Barclay on my show on one of my last shows when I was on the Daily Wire, and I asked him that question pointedly: What is genocide? Mm. Let us know, experts, what percentage of the population of Palestinians has to be killed before we are allowed to say that it is genocide. What I can tell you is I am completely uncomfortable and utterly against the amount of Palestinian innocent lives that have been lost in this conflict, particularly children. And any person who is fearful of stating that the death of innocent children has been utterly unacceptable is a coward. Yeah, I mean, listen, I completely agree, but do you personally think it constitutes genocide, which is the deliberate... Well, what I'm saying to you is we well, quite I can literally, tell you what the, I, I can tell you pursued what the... on my show yeah. what is the number. No, I understand. What is the official number? That's yeah. it. I mean, somebody tell me and I'll give you an answer. Well, I don't think Nobody there is a specific... Try it. try it when you have... Well, it's not about a number. You have on a... both sides of the debate on. Yeah, but it's not... It's not no, no, no. Yeah, but I, what do you mean it's not a number? I, here's my answer. And, I, do they give you an answer? Well, no, because it, here's the point. It's not about specific numbers. It's about an intent. But it has to be. Well, no, it's not. It's about an intent to eradicate That's a not true, Piers, because in America, they call they say that Native Americans, it was a genocide committed by white men. This is what they say, right? No, but I'm talking you about what the I'm talking about what the definition of a genocide is. But it what is, I'm telling you is that that is, would be incorrect because the majority is, of Native Americans died from smallpox. It was accidental. Some some ninety yeah, percent no, of Native no, Americans I'm that lived here died the, from smallpox, and I'm it's telling considered you what the, a genocide. No, I understand. I'm telling you what the what the the definition of genocide is, which is not about a specific number in any circumstance. It's about an intent to target and eradicate a whole people based on their but ethnicity. I, I'm disputing that by telling you that they legally say within America that Native Americans, a genocide was committed against Native Americans. Mm. Factually speaking, 90% of them, 90 and 93% of them died from smallpox. So it was actually an epidemic, right? right. So is the, is the definition shifting? Because it is my understanding from Rabbi Barclay that the definition of anti-Semitism shifts. So maybe the definition of genocide has shifted, but well, let we me read you. Well, let me read you. Let me, genocide well, let me read you the exact. School, let me read you the exact wording and see whether you think definition. it applies to. Well, let me read you the exact. Definition of genocide from the Oxford English Dictionary. The deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. So by that, by that definition, do you believe that is what's happening to the Palestinian people and it's being perpetrated by Israel? Well, I would say is that Israel has proven in the past that they can be very specific when they want to get somebody out, uh, whether that's a hostage or any other certain military operation. And what I am seeing happening, forgetting the specific language of a genocide is something that I'm using my platform to speak out against because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to me what the media calls me. I've had every headline. I do not believe that they are being careful in what they are doing. I think it has been a, in almost, it, it seems to me that the destruction of the hospitals and the schools and of the UN buildings would you say, Piers, that you believe that's unintentional? Uh, I, I do not believe Israel's waging genocide. I, I think that... You believe, the, but I'm asking you, do you believe that I, the targeting I think, going I think you know, the room scale, to in the hospitals well, no, is I'll intentional? Well, no, I'll be clear with you. I, I, I can answer the question. I, I have said repeatedly in the last few weeks and months that I think the proportionality of Israel's response is now unacceptable. And particularly yeah. since they decided to go into Rafa, a refugee camp yeah. that they set up, uh, to then target Hamas in the middle of a refugee camp, we are bound to kill uh, so many innocent civilians in the process, I think is unacceptable. But I, I'm just curious, given that you tweeted about genocide and no government ever has a right to do it, whether by your calculation from that definition, what Israel is doing is deliberately killing a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. Yeah, well, what I can say to you, again, I because these definitions shift, I don't think we need to focus on the word because I'm telling you what I believe. And my belief is that they are not being careful whatsoever. My belief is that there has been too much loss of Palestinian but life. But that's, that's and different to genocide, though, that, isn't it? Yeah, but that, that, okay, that's fine. We don't need to focus. I, I don't know why you're like, obsessing over this one word. It doesn't well, because, matter. Well, because you is, tweeted is about I'm genocide. You, just I'm like only, you told me, I'm only trying the tweet to is what... about Brian Mast. So yeah. uh, you're you're harping on this issue. There's a lot more topics that we should talk about. There I'm are. being very clear in how I feel about this issue. The Israeli government is not being careful in how they're dealing with this. That's I agree with you that the amount of death has been completely unacceptable. When I tweeted that, that was back in November. So we're talking 
way more lives that have been lost. And that tweet was about Brian Mast. So I, I get it. I, no, here's I could my have reason. never imagined the amount of dead Palestinian children that I would see on my ex feed since it, then. It's horrific. You know, it's heartbreaking to me as a mother. It's horrific to me that the media seems almost complicit in the dehumanization of Palestinians. Mm. And I will not be on that side because at the end of the day, the hit pieces, the name calling, mm. the anti Semitism, the psychopathic language that seems to be coming out of people means nothing. And I want to make sure everybody knows this, right? At the end of the day, you are going to have to account to God for the things that you allowed, for the things that you were complicit in, and for the things that you did not have enough courage to state. Okay. The Let amount me... of death of Palestinian children yeah. has been unacceptable, full stop. Okay. Bibi what... Netanyahu, in my view, should not be given a an invitation to Congress. Mm. I think it's unacceptable. I agree. Unacceptable. I don't and think to be clear, be... for whatever the and reason, be leader when it comes to the topic of Israel, it does seem that journalists are fearful to critique Israel. Well, I'm now, not why at all. is that? So, because I would say, Piers, that you too, you too, you seem a little fearful to critique Israel and to want to always seem that you're coming across a little bit understanding of everything they're doing. What is it that makes journalists, well, no, I think corporate his, journalists, no, okay, let me respond. fearful of saying, Can like, hey, you know, Israel has done a ton of things that have been very wrong. Yes, and I have, I have said they're wrong. I think Netanyahu should go. Uh, I think half of that cabinet should go because some of them have definitely been using genocidal language. I think a lot of what Israel's been doing in the last few weeks is completely unacceptable. But ultimately, I also, from the start of this conflict, believe that Israel not only had a right to defend itself after the terror attack on October of the course. 7th, but a fundamental duty to its people. And here's where I'm just curious about your tweeting uh, through this, this procedure, this whole war, because on October the 7th, you didn't tweet anything. You didn't tweet anything on October the 8th. And October the 9th, you tweeted, so much world peace ever since we got the orange man out of office. So glad the adults are back in charge. Um, a lot of people say, well, if you care this much about innocent people being killed, why didn't you say anything when 1,200 people were massacred to death in the most brutal, barbaric manner in this awful terror attack by Hamas? And nearly 7,000 more were wounded, some of them catastrophically and irreparably. Why did that not compel you to say anything? God friend. He comes kicks, he bunch of ass. A bats. God friend.